Welcome, everybody. My name is Tia Silvesi, and I'm a residential horticulture agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hillsborough County. And today I'm going to be talking about butterfly gardening in Central Florida. So spring is here, and it is a great time to get your butterfly garden started or expand it, make it bigger, plant some more flowers. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping and these help they work together to make you have a more sustainable landscape. Um, principle number five is to attract wildlife. And this is including butterflies, bees, birds, and all kinds of other critters that we like to have in our yards. The importance of creating habitat for butterflies is huge. You know, a lot of urban developments now, even suburban, they, they clear cut the entire um, property, like in the entire acreage. And we really end up with a lot of blank lots, a lot of turf grass, and just a few species of plants. We really lack that biodiversity that is needed to sustain wildlife such as butterflies. And especially we need flowers. Flowers provide food and habitat for butterflies. So even you as a resident, you can make a difference in the world, in your own community by planting plants that benefit wildlife and butterflies. So here's some basics of creating habitat for butterflies. We wanna have a variety of flowering plants and we want those plants to be kind of in two categories. One is to provide nectar for the adult butterflies. And secondly, to provide larval host plants. And that's just a fancy word for plants that the caterpillars like to eat. So caterpillars are the larvae of butterflies and the butterfly lay their eggs on these larval host plants. Um, you should include some native plants in your butterfly garden design because the butterflies that are native to Florida have co-evolved with these native plants and they provide just what they need. And then again, most of these plants, they prefer full sun or part sun. Plants that flower just like sunny locations, if it's too shady, they won't get as many flowers and that won't be as good. So here's this pretty picture here and we have that bright purple salvia in the front. Um, we have the pink fire spike in the back left and on the um, front right, we have the red bottle brush. So these are all good plants for butterflies. Butterflies love color. So especially color like yellow, like this Coreopsis here, um, red, like we have for the blanket flower, purple, like for the horse mint, and orange for that fire bush. Um, they also like white, so just plant lots of color. And um, they especially like flowers that have a little landing pad in the middle, like a nice pedestal for them to come and flop on while they nectar. Also, butterflies see an ultraviolet light. So if you were a butterfly, um, this is what plants would look like to you. Isn't that beautiful? The colors just really come out really vibrant. So in order to have butterflies in your yard, we want you to think backwards. And let's look at the butterfly life cycle here. So the adult butterfly lays an egg on that larval host plant or nearby. That is what the caterpillar is going to eat after it hatches out of the egg. Now you can see the egg with your naked eye. Um, it's just a small little dot, usually on the underside of the leaf. So the caterpillar hatches and it eats and it grows and it eats and it eats and it grows. Eventually, you know, the butterfly turns into this J shape preparing to change and then it forms a chrysalis where it goes through the process of metamorphosis and then that kind of makes a clear color, 
you know, it's ready to hatch at that point. So then the chrysalis splits, the butterfly comes out, it might flap its wings for a little bit, um, you know, to dry them off and get the, get the blood pumping through there. And then voila, you have adult butterfly and then it will be ready to visit the flowers on the um, plants that you planted to provide nectar for the adult butterflies. So the plant in this example is the milkweed plant and the butterfly is the monarch butterfly. So the monarch can actually live its entire life cycle on the milkweed from the caterpillar eating the leaves to the adult um, getting nectar from the flowers. So what you wanna do is get to know the butterflies and their larval host plants. So I'll go over a couple common butterflies and what to plant to attract them to your yard You know, for their larval host plants. So let's start with the monarch. Everybody should know milkweeds are for monarchs. Um, the larval host plants are Asclepius, um, different species of milkweed. And we have over 20 species of native milkweed in Florida. We also have some non-native milkweed, which are also larval host plants. You can see the caterpillar here you know, it has that kind of tiger stripe look. So this is a very easy caterpillar to identify. Plus it will most likely be feeding on one of these milkweed plants. So um, also butter monarch butterflies are the only butterflies that will migrate each year. So here's some of the native milkweed species. So these are for central Florida. Uh, my favorite is the swamp milkweed, the Asclepius incarnata. And this one, it can have pinkish or whitish flowers and grow a couple feet tall. Um, this is just a generally good plant for a normal landscape. You know, if you have decent soil and some irrigation, like with your other annuals and perennials, it does really well. The orange butterfly milkweed on the right-hand side, Asclepius tuberosa, um, this is better if you have a hot and a dry area and it kind of like stays low to the ground. So it's not that big or showy. Um, the one on the bottom here is called the white milkweed or aquatic milkweed. And that scientific name is Asclepius perennis. Now this natively grows, you know, in floodplains or riverbanks down in the shady kind of swampy areas. So that one you should plant in shade or in uh, moist soil or, or water it a lot because it, it's used to being kind of in the river floodplain. Now here is a very common non-native species called the tropical milkweed. And this one is native to Mexico. It is very easy to grow. It was the, probably the one you'll see the most common, you know, at big box stores and garden centers. Um, it's very easy to grow from cutting or seeds. It produces a lot of seeds that can be saved and grown. This one, unlike the native milkweeds, it grows year round. Uh, the native milkweeds that I just mentioned, these will come up in the spring. And then in the fall, the plant will, um, the top of the plant will die and it will go dormant, but they're actually perennials. And so they will come back um, year after year. Whereas the tropical milkweed, it doesn't care about winter. It just kind of lives year round. And so this is a little bit problematic for the butterflies because there is a butterfly disease called OE and it is caused by a protozoan parasite and it will live on the stems and the foliage of these tropical milkweeds and that causes the butterfly wings to not form correctly. You could see them with deformed wings or not being able to fly. And so the best way to prevent this disease um, from spreading and infecting butterflies is to cut this plant back like all the way to the ground um, at least once a year. 
And we recommend to do that in the fall, like around Thanksgiving time. And that way, none of this OE is persisting on the plant stems and leaves. Just cut it back and then it should regrow. And then that will help to prevent that. So, you know, if, if you're more advanced, you know, go with the native species. But if you're just a beginner, even having a tropical milkweed is better than not having any milkweed at all for the monarchs, but just manage it by cutting it back once a year. So then there's also the giant milkweed, and this is uh, another non-native plant. It's native to Asia and Africa, um, Calotropis gigantea. And this is very easy to grow from cutting, and it kind of turns into a, a large shrub, and it is perennial. It's evergreen. It doesn't go dormant or lose its leaves. Um, it is somewhat cold sensitive, so it's only recommended for Central and South Florida. Um, and it is drought tolerant, like it likes really sunny and dry locations. And so you can scan the QR code here that takes you to a blog that I wrote on the giant milkweed. Um, so the next butterfly is the Gulf fritillary butterfly. And the larval host plants for this include different types of passion vine or passiflora, um, such as the passiflora incarnata, which is the purple passion flower here with this beautiful purple flower. Also the passiflora suberosa, the quirky stemmed passion flower, and um, the yellow passion flower, passiflora lutea. So you can see the caterpillar is kind of this black with the orange stripe and these black spikes on it. So pretty easy to identify. And this is a very common caterpillar, very easy to attract um, to your backyard and in normal landscape settings. Next is the sulfur butterfly. And you can see the the caterpillar here is kind of a yellow. It has that yellow stripe. It's kind of a greenish caterpillar. And then the butterfly, there are many sulfur butterflies, but they are mostly yellow in color, this pasty yellow color. And oddly enough, they tend to like these yellow flowers in the pea or bean family, the Fabiaceae family. Um, things such as the Senna ligastrina, um, pictured here on the left, or um, the Senna marylandica, the Mar Maryland Senna. Also, there's a sickle pod, um, there's cassia, candlestick cassia, Bahama cassia. So it just likes these kind of leguminous plants with the yellow flowers. And there's many different types of sulfurs, but they're all hosts on legume plants. Next is the swallowtail butterfly. And there are 10 species of butterflies, um, swallowtails in Florida. And each one has its own specific larval host plant. So the wild lime, um, some of them feed on citrus, uh, wild cherry, magnolias, tulip tree, pond apple, pawpaw, and also herbs like parsley, fennel, and dill. So if you see a caterpillar eating your parsley plant, it is most likely a swallowtail caterpillar. Same thing with your citrus. If you see the um, swallowtail, then that's, that's a swallowtail caterpillar. So here is the citrus leaf with the swallowtail, um, the giant swallowtail caterpillar on the leaf and and these things look funny they kind of look like uh, bird poop and they don't move like a whole lot either so you know I was like what is that on my citrus tree and then you look it up so you know before you just go killing all the bugs in your yard you know make sure it's not uh, a beautiful butterfly like the swallowtail and the giant swallowtail is the largest butterfly that we have in Florida so definitely one of these you want to attract to your yard. Um, the zebra longwing is another common one. This tends to like kind of shady, um, not so exposed areas. Um, I rarely see the caterpillars. They're these white caterpillars with these black spikes. And this one, like the Gulf fritillary, also um, has 
passive passion vine as its larval host plants. So you have the Passiflora incarnata here, the Suberosa, the quirky stem passion flower. This is also Florida's state butterfly. Next, we have the buckeye butterfly. And the buckeye, you can tell this butterfly because of these circles, you know, on its wings. It's a very beautiful butterfly, a little bit of a smaller one. It has a pretty inconspicuous caterpillar. I don't see this one often either. And what you'll notice about the buckeye is it likes these purple flowers. So the false phlox glove, which is where the caterpillar is pictured here, um, the twin flower here in the bottom center, also the native Carolina wild petunia, the Ruellia carolinaensis here. Um, and it also likes this Indian plantain or the Plantago lanceolata. And this one, some people consider to be a lawn weed, but it's actually a native plant to North America. And it is a larval host plant for the buckeye butterfly. So once you learn that, maybe you'll just kind of mow and go and leave it be in your yard. Um, that's up to you, but it is a larval host plant. And so that wraps it up for the common butterflies you might see. Um, next, I'm going to talk about how to start a butterfly garden. And so the first thing you want to do is you want to pick your site. You want to choose a sunny site. Um, it doesn't have to be, but you might prefer it to be viewable from your house, like right outside your living room window or something. Um, you're going to want some access to water because the plants are going to need to be watered to establishment and a little bit um, thereon, you know, especially in times of drought. And uh, it's good if you can have a 10 by 10 area or larger, but even if you're just starting with a small container garden or you get started with one or two plants, that's fine. And maybe you can expand later, but any, any plants are better than none. So next you want to make your design and you want to use um, different layers. We have a concept called vertical layering where we're planting things at different heights. And that way the butterfly has some ground cover, you know, some annuals, perennials, and maybe some small shrubs or trees for protection, for habitat, for food. And um, make it lots of color because the butterflies are visually attracted to masses of colors. So you can make a design, you know, for a container, a small garden, or your whole yard. Maybe you plant your whole perimeter with butterfly plants. So when you want to choose your plants, um, we just went over the larval host plants that are specific for the different butterflies. And then you're also going to want nectar plants for the adult butterflies. These can be things like butterfly bush, zinnia, um, gallardia, tick seed, marigold, lantana, porterweed, and many more. And they're not specific to certain types of butterflies. They're just general plants that provide nectar. They might also attract bees and other beneficial insects. And so I'm going to go over those now. So here's some easy to grow annuals um, like cosmos, zinnias, marigolds, Coreopsis, there's some native species. That's actually our state wildflower. Also the blanket flower or gallardia, um, phlox and black-eyed Susan. So this is a cheap and easy way to get your garden started by just buying a couple packs of seeds and preparing your seed bed by fluffing it up. You know, put the seeds in, pat them down, water it in, and within 30 to 60 days, you can have some flowers getting started. Um, perennials are a easy way to have a long-term garden with low maintenance, especially if you picked Florida-friendly ones that are well-suited for our conditions here in Florida. So in this picture here, we have some native frog fruit on the left with the tiny little flowers. In the center, we have some white pentas. 
And then on the far right is some African blue basil. So these are all Florida friendly plants. Um, other good choices include salvia, lantana, um, bush daisies, milkweeds, the porterweed, and bulbine is a little ground cover that makes a great um, perennial nectar plant. The salvias is definitely something you should include in your garden, like the red salvia pictured here to the right. That is a native Florida plant, salvia coccinia, and it grows well in the shade. So if you have a shady garden, then get this native red salvia. They're available from native plant nurseries. Um, you can check that out online. Also, the blue salvia is, is very common commercially, and there's some Mexican sage. Um, liar leaf sage is another native, and pineapple sage. So sages, salvias, um, definitely a wonderful plant to incorporate into your butterfly garden. Now we're going to get into some shrubs. So the shrubs provide a great backdrop for your butterfly garden. And then you can have some annuals and perennials in the front. And these just live for a long time. They're minimal maintenance, very Florida friendly. A lot of these are drought tolerant too. So we have the fire bush and that's pictured in the, the back left. Um, butterfly bush, the cassia, plumbago is a great one, very drought tolerant. You'll see that one on the roadside, the purple plumbago, or they have a white color too. Also Jatropha, that's the hot pink tree here in the back center, um, bottle brush, and the chase tree. These are all good ones to plant. And then don't forget about the trees. So butterflies can nectar from trees as well. And some good choices here include fiddlewood, almond bush, that also smells good. Um, the coral bean, which is a native um, small tree and the flatwoods plum, which is pictured here. So here we have two flatwoods plums and then there's some tipicina under there. And in the front is that bulbine I was talking about. So this just makes a real nice ground cover and it blooms almost year round too. It's very drought tolerant and hardy. Um, don't forget about your vines too. So the coral honeysuckle is an excellent native vine. And this is also the top choice to plant for hummingbirds too. If you want to attract hummingbirds to your garden, plant this one. Um, so it is relatively easy to grow and commonly available in native plant nurseries. The passion vine, those are vines. There's also climbing aster and trumpet vine with the yellow trumpet shaped flowers. And then just to finish up your butterfly garden, so you want to do things like add a two to three layer of mulch, and that is going to help to keep the weeds down and conserve your soil moisture. And you want to maintain the garden, but not too neat because you got to be careful, like the butterflies are going to want to get on some dead sticks or on your garden um, you know, plants to turn into that chrysalis, you know, when they're going through their life cycle. So don't keep it too trimmed up and neat, you know, let, let it be. And then, you know, things are going to die. That's just part of plants. So, you know, keep the garden spruced up. Um, if something dies, just dig it up and replace it, you know, get something else growing there. And so it's a really fun hobby. There's always something to do or look at in the butterfly garden. You also want to water the garden. So, you know, especially after planting new plants, you want to water it until they're established, which is usually about one month later, uh, maybe twice a week. And when we want to use the most efficient method of watering. So for example, low flow irrigation, uh, like micro irrigation or the rotary sprinkler head here on the top right. Um, you can use a rain barrel to catch water or create a rain garden as a butterfly garden in a, in a depression or dig a depression in your yard for that. Um, you can also hand water, you know, just manually hand water or one of these lawn sprinklers, and that works fine too.
And then you want to provide water for butterflies. So butterflies can't drink out of bird baths. It's like too deep for them. Um, they kind of have special needs for absorbing their water and they also get minerals. So butterflies, you know, what you can do to support them is to provide a puddling station. And that's what this little saucer with the sand and rocks is. So here's how you build one of those. Um, start by just, you know, buy one of those clay saucers for plants and put some sand in it, add a little compost. So that's going to help the butterflies get their minerals and then place the pebbles on the top or some rocks or whatever you have. And that will be a place where the butterflies can land and then fill it up with water. So it's not holding a lot of water here. It's more like the butterflies are just puddling and they're absorbing you know, the um, nutrients. And so it does dry out kind of quickly. So you might have to water it, you know, a couple times a week or put it where your irrigation will fill it back up. And then um, fertilizer is the next thing. So you want to fertilize responsibly, you know, follow the local ordinances. Here in Hillsborough County, we have no fertilizer of nitrogen or phosphorus um, between June 1st and September 30th. And so, um, but regardless of the ordinance, don't fertilize before heavy rains. We want the fertilizer to go for the plants and not in our waterways. And also don't use pesticides because even organic sprays like PBT for caterpillars, they can kill um, caterpillars of butterflies too. So it's okay if it's a, a different part of your yard, like you're spraying your vegetable garden, but don't spray those sprays in your butterfly garden. Even if you have aphids or something, you know, just let them be and you can create a more ecological landscape like the ladybugs and other insects will show up to eat the aphids. So don't really worry about them. Or you can use like a jet hose like to spray those bugs off. So here's a bigger concept. If you want to go for the big picture, you know, it goes beyond people's backyards. We want to create uh, community butterfly scapes. And we have a whole EDIS document on this. The website's below here, or you can scan the QR code to find it. But the idea is, you know, you get together with your whole community or your whole HOA and everybody plants a little bit in their yard and do that in the natural, you know, areas, the shared areas. And then um, you just plant butterfly attracting vegetation and that's going to provide the pollen and nectar shelter and nesting sites for the butterflies and promote them to be in your neighborhood. Um, so this is a really cool concept and a great publication you can read. Another resource is this butterfly gardening app. And this is from the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Um, so you can go to the website at ffl.ifis.ufl.edu and look for the apps or you can scan the QR code here. Just put in Florida Friendly um, Butterfly Garden app. And from this, you can put in your zip code and ch choose what kind of plants you want, like shrubs or trees or annuals, perennials. And it will pull up a list of butterfly plants that are suited for your area. And so that has 190 different plants in the app and 62 different butterflies. So it's a great resource. And then you can even design your butterfly garden in the app. It's really cool. Another great resource is this publication here. It's just a kind of a one page handout. And this is called Attracting Butterflies with Florida's Native Wildflowers. This was put out by the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And you can find this online if you Google like Florida Wildflowers Attracting Butterflies, or you can scan the QR code here. So these are some great resources for you. So I invite you to connect with us. Um, you can find me on Tia Silvesi UF Blogs. That's where the QR code goes to. Also on Facebook, we're Hillsborough Extension, um, Instagram and YouTube. Look for UF IFIS, Hillsborough County. 
and follow what we do. We'll post this video on the YouTube and we post our upcoming classes, whatnot on the Facebook. We also have the Eventbrite page. So follow us and join us for some more classes. So that wraps it up for today. I'd like to thank you for attending and um, please scan the little code here to take our survey. Let, let our bosses know that I'm doing a good job and um, thank you for coming. Have a great day.